Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, doesn't take long to figure out. We've changed up the setting here a little bit just to freshen it up a little bit. Um, you know, we are so grateful that you're here with us today. Uh, a couple of things. Remember that our bulletin is online, citysoulministries.org. Uh, we have a few announcements coming here and there, so you can stay up on that. Um, also, our offering numbers are on there. You can see how we're doing as a church and maybe how you can step up and be a blessing. We are beginning to pray about our special offering that we will run from uh, Thanksgiving to the end of the year. And that is a uh, tradition that we have here at City Soul, really to help us uh, meet our budget, especially for this year. It's been a trying year for all of us. And by God's grace, the church has is survived and doing well financially, um, but we've got some ground to make up. And you can stay tuned for that, uh, but just a couple of things to get you thinking and praying about uh, in the weeks and months to come. So we are going to jump right into our series in the Gospel of John. We are in chapter 14, verses 12 through 17 today. So remember what the setting is here. If you're just tuning in today or you just need a refresher from last week, Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room the night before he is going to be crucified. So it's Thursday night. Judas has left. Um, He's going to betray Jesus. We know that. Uh, That's going to happen. But in the meantime, while Judas is gone, um, Jesus begins to address his disciples. Jesus has recently told Peter that he's going to deny him on three separate occasions before the morning comes. Preached a whole message about that. Uh, And then Jesus gets into comforting his disciples with some incredible, incredible promises. Last week, we read those promises in the previous verses as Jesus talks about heaven and how he is going to prepare a place for those who believe in him. and He will return for us, Um, that our our, our home is not here. Our our home is in heaven, that our eternal place of residence will be with the Father's house, in the Father's house for all who have their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today, Jesus gives some continued comfort to his disciples and to us. But let me make a quick disclaimer. We have studied some very, very deep doctrinal truths in the Gospel of John. You know, for example, you know, the rebirth. You know, we've talked about um, you know, the sovereignty of God in salvation. You know, that it is God who draws us in faith to his Son. We've talked about you know, the perseverance of the saints. We've talked about uh, divine election. We've talked about all of these very, very deep doctrinal things. But also understand, as I've pointed out numerous times throughout the Gospel of John, We have seen scripture misused and taken out of context and used wrongly. And we've pointed out those things and and been very, you know, uh, very honest and talked about those things in our sermons. Well, today is one of those passages where the words of Jesus have been very misused and applied in very selfish, self-serving ways from what we're going to read and study today. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I think as we read our first two verses here, it's going to immediately jump off the page to you of, of, of maybe some questions you have, like, what does Jesus mean here? Well, we're going to talk about that today. So let's look at verses 12 through 14. Jesus starts out by saying to his disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me also will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do and the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, let's hold up here. I mean, there is a a lot that Jesus is saying here. Is Jesus telling us that the things that we will do will be greater than the things that he has done? For example, does that mean that we're going to be able to perform miracles, you know, raise people from the dead? I mean, how much more Greater things could we do than Jesus raising someone from the dead, healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, you know, um, feeding the the 15,000 people at at the feeding that day. Jesus, you're telling me that I'm going to be able to do greater things than this? Wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. Is this, if we like stumbled upon in our series through the gospel of John verse by verse, like this magical formula that Jesus has given us here? That if we say a prayer, any prayer, and then at the end, tack on in Jesus' name, that whatever we ask for, it's going to happen. Or if we stir up enough faith, you know, get ourselves into an emotional frenzy and, and claim something, say, this is what I'm claiming for my life. This is what I want. This is what's going to happen. And then 
when I tack in Jesus' name at the end, that like, that's going to happen? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Let me get you thinking. All of us would agree today, I would believe, and if you don't agree, you can let me know, but I would say that all of us would agree today that we would like to see world hunger stomped out, right? I mean, I would say that, and I would say you would as well. So let's suppose today that we all came together instead of preaching today, and we just said a simple prayer like this. Dear Lord, we ask today that world hunger would cease, that every single person in every nook and cranny all over the world would have the food that they need. In Jesus' name, amen. So we raise our heads, open our eyes, and we begin to look around. Is that now fixed? Has that been, uh, has that prayer been answered fully? Like since we asked in Jesus' name, and what we're praying for, I mean, it is a great thing. I mean, that's a very great thing. That's a very noble thing to want and to pray for and desire. That now, since we've prayed that in Jesus' name, that world hunger is no longer an issue because we asked in Jesus' name. Now, of course, we would want this to happen. And I mean, there's, there's a long list of things that we could pray for in Jesus' name that are great things and would certainly you know, uh, be, be good for so many people. But this is not what Jesus is teaching us here. He's not teaching us that this is the magical formula for us to um, get whatever we desire, what we pray for, even though this is a good thing that we might be praying for. My study Bible says it this way. Jesus did not mean greater works in power, but in extent. Jesus did not mean greater works in power, but in extent. Hmm. So I'm sure you've probably heard someone say something like this before, maybe in your Christian circles, maybe on uh, some pastor said it or, or whatever, that they would push back against the idea that Jesus literally meant that if we say any prayer and tack on his name at the end, that he is now obligated to answer that prayer and it's always going to be granted. It almost sounds like, you know, if you believe that, that Jesus is almost like our personal genie, (laughs) that like we have this ability to manipulate and whatever we want or whatever we desire, good, bad, or whatever, if we tack on Jesus's name, that it's going to be granted. Now, I don't think that it takes a whole lot of discernment for us to look at this and say, that sounds off base, does it not? I mean, that that, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't really sit right. I mean, I I hear what Jesus is saying, but as we're starting to talk about it and, and really dissect it, that sounds a little self-centered, does it not? It sounds very me-centered and very us-centered when we think about, well, what can I get or what can I do uh, by just saying this prayer and tacking on Jesus's name? That sounds a little self-centered instead of gospel-centered, does it not? Well, let me tell you about a very popular movement that we see in our American culture today and in church culture today. It's often what we hear and see from maybe some very famous TV preachers that you've heard. And it's what is called, and maybe you're familiar with this, maybe you're not, it's called the Word of Faith Doctrine. The Word of Faith Doctrine. I will start off by saying and making it crystal clear that this is a false, self-centered, flesh-appealing scheme to sell Christianity, to sell um, a self-centered view and kind of sprinkle in Jesus' name. It's abbreviated the WOF, the Word of Faith Doctrine. And what they believe from these verses, especially what Jesus is saying here, is simply this, that we have power in our words to name and to claim whatever you desire. The Word of Faith movement can also be known as the name name it, claim it type of theology. That blessings in our lives, blessings in your life hinge upon the words that you speak and specifically how boldly you declare those things to come true into your life. This name it, claim it theology is so incredibly bad and devastating. I don't have the time to cover it all today, but I just wanted to introduce it to you, to know that this is out there. But what is being taught is that if you're poor, for example, this is kind of an extreme example, you're poor because you haven't boldly claimed and believed with strong enough faith that you can be rich, that you're not speaking words into your life, you know, looking in the mirror and saying, I am, I am rich, you know, I'm going to have money, I'm not going to be poor. 
you know, and make sure and do it in Jesus's name. That if you're sick, the reason that you're sick based upon some of the word of faith um, reasoning is the reason that you're sick is because your faith is weak. You don't have enough faith and that's why you're sick. Or there's some sort of hidden sin in your life that you must figure out what that sin is. And that's why you're sick. The bottom line is this word of faith ideology is that everything hinges upon you and it's ultimately all about you. I have personally talked to and been around many people who have been devastated by this name it, claim it, word of faith theology. People literally broke into tears, driven to mental insanity because they believe that the, the word of faith theology believes that your health, your, your wealth, your overall existence depends upon you. It depends upon your words or how, or how powerful your prayers were. If your prayers are powerful enough, then you know, it's going to happen. Or that words that you've spoken into your life, you, know, you, you didn't speak them with enough bold uh, declaration. This word of faith stuff is so dangerous and quite frankly, so wrong. I could go on and on. And many have fallen victim to an idea that when Jesus says things like he says here today, that he is speaking, that we have the power to do greater miracles, miraculous signs, and we have the power to speak things into existence. Guess what? That sells very well. People love a message that's catered to them. People love a message. Human beings love messages, especially in churches, that can tell them how to get what they want. And when we can twist and manipulate scripture to appeal to our flesh and our own desires, and it's very man-centered and self-centered and not gospel-centered, that sells very well. But do you know what doesn't sell as well? Seeing that the Bible isn't about us, but it's about the glory of God. In this instance, Jesus isn't opening the door. He isn't leaving like a crack here. He isn't giving us like this you know, magical formula to be your personal genie or my personal genie. But he is saying that the rapid spread of the gospel through these disciples all the way up until this very moment would be taking place. And that, of course, is a greater work. It is so selfish for us to believe that physical healings or you know, money and pleasure and, and comfort are the most important things in our lives. Do you know what the greatest work possible is? Think about that for a second. What's the greatest work? What's the greatest miracle that can ever happen? It's the conversion of a dead soul. When someone believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, when a work is done in their lives, when God quickens their heart by the Holy Spirit and they respond in faith to the finished work of Jesus Christ. What Jesus has in view here thinking in the context, are the events that would take place after his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension back to heaven. Those events are the, con- are the conversions of souls, which will take place under the ministry of the apostles, uh, the miracles that the apostles would be performing, which are um, limited to the, the apostolic era, era where they would be doing these miraculous signs and wonders to kick off the spread of the gospel, to go from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And then fast forwarding to 2020, the amazing works that God is doing through the work of his Holy Spirit for the gospel today. There is such a misunderstanding of what the true gospel is. The greater works that we see visibly in the lives of Christians today are those greater works. It's the fruits in the lives of those who are following Jesus. It's the fruits in the churches that are faithfully preaching the gospel. The Holy Spirit working through frail, weak, broken, sinful human beings, just like me and just like you. Let's make it more personal for just a second. Let me talk about my personal experience of the Lord using me. For nearly 18 years, I can humbly say that that God God has used me. And I take zero credit for anything. I mean, it's all him. It's all his glory. It's all for his glory. And it's all by his strength. He used me as an instrument 
of his gospel for roughly seven years in youth ministry. And I had no idea at the time how much influence I had upon the lives of those teens. But in my weaknesses and my insecurities, his gospel shined through. So now, fast forwarding, 11 years being the lead pastor at this church, City Soul. At the age of 25, planting this church with God's sovereign hand behind it all. I was underqualified, nervous, young, so many insecurities. But our sovereign God has used my weaknesses and the strengths that he's given me to advance his gospel. And when Jesus was on the earth, he performed the miracle of raising the physical bodies of men. I mean, he did that with Lazarus. We studied that here in the Gospel of John. But you know what our privilege is today? You know what the greater work that we get to do is by the power of the Holy Spirit? Is we get the unspeakable privilege of being born again, of being saved, and preaching the gospel, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, so that all of God's chosen, all of God's sheep will hear that message, repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and have eternal life. The ultimate goal, the ultimate privilege is to be instrumental, to be a link in the chain of bringing men and women into the truth of the gospel message. When Jesus Christ takes you and he takes me and he sovereignly uses us to reach people, that is greater and that is enough. Nothing is more valuable than our soul and the souls of others. Nothing. But it's tragic that that simply isn't enough. Many will read Jesus' words here, and instead of automatically thinking about the glory of God and the gospel advancing, here's how many will read that. We will read that and begin to think, think things like, well, hmm, what can I get from this? You know, how can I pray something and tack on Jesus' name at the end and and name it and claim it for me, or name it and claim it for someone else? Or what can I ask for that would you know, make my life better in Jesus' name? Don't misunderstand. Of course we pray for healing. We do. I mean, I, I pray you know, f- for folks that are around me all the time. You know, we get your prayer requests, and we're constantly praying. We have a prayer team that prayers, that, that prays for you. We pray for our loved ones who are sick. We trust God with every aspect of our lives. But even Lazarus, who was raised by Jesus, he physically died again. Don't be so deceived by false teaching that pumps selfish, self-centered thoughts into your head. And, And I will be the first to say, it's appealing. I mean, it is very, very appealing, and it appeals to the human nature and condition. But it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the advancing of the gospel. It's about the glory of God. When we pray, of course, we need to understand that God knows what's best for us. We don't. So we pray that his will should be done and not our will. God can heal and he still does. And it's amazing. But it's all within his sovereign will. So if someone isn't healed, you know, we've prayed, we've rallied around this person, we've prayed for them for months or, or years and that person isn't healed. We can't use the word of faith theology and say that it was our fault, that we didn't pray hard enough, or our prayers weren't genuine enough, or we didn't get emotional enough, or we didn't stir up enough emotion, or we didn't come into agreement with enough people. Our prayers didn't have enough faith. No, that is damaging, that is hurtful, and that is not the case of the gospel. In this passage, Jesus comforts his disciples They were about to be the ones who God was sovereignly using to begin the New Testament church. The things they were about to do would be greater things in essence and extent because now the gospel Jesus had completed, it is finished. He was going to be doing that here in just a day going to the cross. He was going to uh, lay down his life voluntarily. He was going to raise again. He was going to ascend back to heaven. And now the greater work of the gospel advancing But now we see another promise that Jesus gives, and we're just going to touch upon this briefly today. Uh, The power of the Holy Spirit that is to come. Let's go to verse 15 and read that. And this little section is entitled, Jesus Promises the Holy Spirit. Let's just read verse 15 and we'll talk about that briefly. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now that's not hard to understand, right? I don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that. 
This is a, a cause and effect statement by Jesus. Obedience matters. Love will be on display in our lives when we are obedient to Christ. We keep his commands because we love him. And I just simply ask you today, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? And then verses 16 and 17. Let's read those in closing. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. As Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to intercede to the Father. I'm going to ask the Father to send the comforter that is going to take the place of me. I'm going back to the Father, but I'm going to ask the Father to send you a helper, one that will be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. This term, uh, the Greek word here means another of the same kind. In other words, it's going to be like Jesus himself, someone who will take his place, do his work, and be with them. My study Bible says it this way. My MacArthur study Bible says it this way. The Spirit of Christ is the third person of the Trinity, having the same essence of deity as Jesus and is perfectly one with him as he is with the Father. The term helper, the Greek term here means one called alongside to help and has the idea of someone who encourages and exhorts. The term be with you that Jesus uses has to do with this permanent residence in believers. So we see here the Trinity on display. Jesus prays to the Father to send the person of the Holy Spirit. The whole Trinity, the whole Trinity is at work here. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and applies that truth to the life of the believer. Again, my study Bible says in a way that's easily understood, it says, apart from the Holy Spirit, we cannot know God's truth. The scripture says, for he dwells with you. Jesus says, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now this indicates some distinction between the ministry of the Holy Spirit to believers before Pentecost. Pentecost has not happened yet here on the timeline. It's about to happen. While clearly the Holy Spirit has been with all who have ever believed, you know, the Holy Spirit has not ever not existed. You know, the Holy Spirit was still at work even in the Old Testament as the source of truth, faith, and life. But Jesus is saying something new is coming in his ministry. Now, the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is clearly there. Anyone who believed God in the Old Testament, how did they do it? By the power of the Holy Spirit. But now, the Holy Spirit will be given to all believers fully. Here's the bottom line. Believers have the Holy Spirit and unbelievers don't. So the disciples are comforted by Jesus in knowing that the Spirit of God that was with them now has always been there. And the Holy Spirit is going to come in a fuller role now. To understand the Trinity fully, be the first to admit, it's something that our minds can't fully understand. But we affirm it, the Trinity here at work as Jesus says this, we affirm the things that Jesus says here today of understanding the things, the works that we are called to do. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is convicting you this morning as it's as he has convicted me this week in preparing this message. And however he's convicting you today, if that's first of all to put your faith in Jesus Christ, then respond in faith today by um, confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, today we humbly come before your word, and it is so amazing, so sanctifying, so challenging, so edifying for our lives. And Father, I just praise you for this uh, incredible passage that you've given us today. Help us to better understand and not be so quick to be so self-centered when we read Scripture. The Father, it's about you, it's about your glory, and it's about your kingdom sovereignly advancing. And, you know, we need to, to understand that. Father, I pray for your church here at City Soul. I pray that, Father, you would continue to stir in us a passion for your word, a passion for your glory. Father, I thank you for those who have listened to this message today, and I, I pray for those who need to respond to you in faith that, Father, today... They will by responding uh, to you and, and putting faith, their faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Father, we thank you. We love you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.